agenda is set. Hello, everyone. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. Today on the show, a world where the new norm is outside the norm. Your mental health may no longer be what it used to be. Diagnosing ourselves crazy. We've got a prescription and more today. It's time to talk. What's going on in your head? A new mental health Bible has just been published. Now, critics say it's leading doctors down a disturbing path where no one is mentally healthy anymore. Can we save normal? And how many more pills do we need to treat the human condition? Immigration policy between Latin America and the United States, it is one of the biggest broken stories of the Western Hemisphere. Every day, people risk their lives heading north in pursuit of the American dream. If they survive the trek, they end up in legal limbo. Immigrants alienated by the system they want to join, victimized by the systems they left behind. Today, we ask, is there hope for a fix? And do you recognize this pose? Now, it has become the trademark of the world's most powerful female politician. German Chancellor Angela Merkel is the embodiment of the country's divided past and its unified present. Ahead of national elections this fall, the bookstores are packed with new biographies about her. Some say the reading is shocking. Today, what we know and what we think we know about Europe's leading woman. Well, I've invited three people today to talk, argue, and pry apart these headlines. My first guest says that the new books about Merkel show the world that she is, as many people have suspected all along, very normal. I'm happy to welcome to the show Mr. Jochen Stadt. He is one of Germany's leading historians on the division between East and West. He heads the East Germany Research Project at the Free University here in Berlin. Mr. Stott, one of these biographies makes the claim that Merkel, as a young student in East Germany, was a good communist. She was trusted by the communist regime. Is this the chancellor that we know? Well, she was, uh, like everybody was in the uh, university system in East Germany, 80% um, of the people were in the free German use. So I think she was an average person at that time. Okay, at that time. We're going to talk more about um, answering about her past in just a second. Good to have you on the show. My second guest says that the U.S. and Europe are wrong to be talking about migration as a crime. I'm happy to welcome Laura Aguirre. She's a sociologist from El Salvador who has spent time with Alejandro Solalinda. He is the Mexican priest leading the caravan of hope on Washington, D.C. right now. Laura, how can the discussion in the U.S. get beyond the fact that people who cross the border into the U.S. without permission, how do we get beyond the fact that they are committing a crime when they do that? Well, I think uh, we can uh, go beyond when we stop to think in migrants just as a crime or migration as a crime. If uh, we want to, to make a a solution and to have a more options, we, ha we must to think about migration uh, more like an economic thing, human rights thing, and of course um, something um, uh, about law, but not only about criminal. And the fact that it is here to stay, it's not going away. Yes. It's good to have you on the show, Laura. And my next guest says that the new Diagnostic Guide of Mental Disorders, the DSM-5, is indeed a failure. I'm happy to welcome to the show Dr. Henrik Walter. He is a psychiatrist, he's a neurologist, and he's a brain, brain researcher here in Berlin. Dr. Walter, what went wrong when your peers sat down to update this book to create the DSM-5? I think when they sat down, uh, there was a good agenda, actually, because 10 years ago, uh, the psychiatrist wanted to incorporate more objective knowledge about mental disorders into the new Bible, mm -hmm. which is not a Bible, but more like a lexicon at the moment. Okay, well, we're going to talk about this book that some say is, some say is it a Bible. The DSM-5 is a book for the, and it's important to note this, the American medical community. It is not a guidebook here in Europe, for example, but its influence is global. Every doctor knows the book and has at some point at least looked into it, if not used it. It gives names to disorders, and these names spread and become the norm. Just think of how the world talks about autism today as if it were just as 
common in every day as a headache. Well, that is the DSM's power. Criticism of this new edition has come from every corner. Even the doctors who wrote the DSM-4 say the new book threatens to diagnose everyone with a problem. Even being sad can now be considered a disorder. And guess what? The pharmaceutical companies are more than happy to offer a pill to fill the doctor's prescription. The latest edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health, or DSM-5, is a key benchmark for determining mental health disorders such as depression. This version of the Bible of psychiatric diagnoses also includes new disorders relating to childhood temper tantrums, grief, and binge eating. It also recognizes excessive online gaming for the first time. Some critics say the new DSM-5 could lead to doctors overdiagnosing. The fear is more people than ever will soon be defined as being psychologically ill. And other critics say that defining new mental illnesses also plays into the hands of pharmaceutical companies eager to sell more pills. Dr. Valter, is that what is happening with this book? Is it basically a license for everyone to say, I've got a disorder, I need a pill? Well, you, you see, this book has several functions. So one function is to make a catalog of disorders and to be able to talk about the same thing. That's the good thing about it. The problem is now that it's out, in particular since DSM-4 is out, it has become a Bible and with a lot of sociological uh, functions, for example, like getting money for uh, treatment and so on. And this is one big problem. So it's not intra-psychiatric, but it's rather a societal problem. Um, you as a psychiatrist, as, as a neurologist, are you less likely to turn to this new volume now when you're you know, diagnosing patients? Well, first of all, uh, in Germany, we have to uh, turn to the ICD-10, okay, which is very right. similar exactly. to the DSM-5. But, but it, DSM but it, it is a book of global importance, though. I mean, exactly. would you say that the, that the importance of this book is now diminished? Yes, it is, in a certain way, because it has become under heavy fire and actually it was planned differently. So because psychiatry already in the DSM-4 was aware that it has to make progress on the biological side, that is not just to count symptoms and to name it as a disorder, but to, to find out what is... Uh, what are different kinds of depression, for example, what are different kinds of anxiety disorders. And what's causing them, and, right? Yeah, and what's causing them and what, what are the mechanisms and if there can be differential treatments for differential disorders. And, I mean, and isn't that the, the criticism that people have when, when they look at this book? They say, doctors like yourself, when you're treating people with mental disorders, um, you're basing your diagnosis on their symptoms, but the causative factors, what's behind the feelings of depression, for example. The doctors are never even touching those. No, that's not true. Okay, we're, we're, we're touching it already, okay. yeah. But we don't... But it's not as easy as diagnosing someone, for example, who's got bronchitis or who's got cancer. Well, in certain cases it is, because we have to distinguish between clear psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia or major depression, which is very severe, or severe obsessive dis compulsive disorder. There's no disagreement about that. But there are certain, at the, you know, at the borders, there are a lot of problems. And the problem is that in the new book, it was planned to include severity as a major ingredient of this book. But they have give up, given up on this, the doctors. And also, they have given up on of including biological measures, for example, uh, to be able to diagnose things, because science is not at, as advanced as it should be. And that's why, for example, Anne Francis, the head of the DSM-4 DSM is who criticizing was not only DSM-5, but he's criticizing his own book because he said he made some mistakes. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it sounds like you're describing voodoo medicine when you talk about this, Dr. Walter. I mean, you're saying that they don't want to look at the biological causes behind a condition, but isn't that what doctors and researchers are supposed to do? No, they, they want, but they're not far enough that they can use it as a manual for practical medicine. That's a problem. And just two weeks ago, uh, the head of the department for, of the NIMH, the world's largest funding organization mm -hmm. for psychiatric research, has said in research we want to have another orientation, to have a more scientific orientation to that. But you can't change the boat while you're riding on it. That's a problem. Right. And so basically what this means is that in practice people will use this book 
they will diagnose, perhaps also overdiagnose things. Mm -hmm. But in research, and they're trying to establish new categories. Yeah, I mean, if, if I look at what's inside the DSM-5 now, I mean, I, it, it, it really it begs a little explanation. Temper tantrums, for example, that children have, um, have now become disruptive mood dysregulation disorders. Grief, being sad, has now become a major de depressive disorder. Um, keeping too much junk, which I'm sure everyone can relate to at some point in their lives, has now become a hoarding disorder. And if you are forgetful sometimes, you can now have mild neurocognitive disorder. Now, it, that, that all seems ridiculous, but if you take it further, isn't the DSM-5 paving the way for doctors to write prescriptions for medications that the pharmaceuticals are just jumping to bring to the market? First of all, you have to be a little fair because it's not like grief is depressive disorder now, but in former times it was that there's depressive disorder and only if you had bereavement, for example, someone died, this was an exclusion criteria and they have skipped that. This has become under much criticism and you can discuss about that. The reason being is that they say, well, if someone has a depressive disorder and caused, for example, or induced mm -hmm. by the death of a nearby, we shouldn't exclude him for getting medication paid. That's one thing. Okay. So, and the other thing about the pills, that's a very important point. And yes. I think there's a big difference between uh, the States and, for example, Europe, because the biggest problem here is not the DSM-5 or the DSM-4, but the biggest problem is that in the States, it's allowed to advertise for drugs, for medication, drugs, right. for prescriptions. That's not allowed in Europe and for good reasons. And that's one of the biggest problem. And it was already in DSM-4. Right. L Doctor, how many people would you say are walking around right now with a mental disorder? I mean, let's, you know, not even look at the DSM-5. How many people have a problem? Yeah, you can say that very exactly because there are very good scientific studies on that, in Europe at least. So in Europe, the prevalence to have, meaning that in one year, how probable is that you have a mental disorder is about 40%. So nearly half of the so, population. Okay, so almost half of the population walking around right now. So that means two of us at Within this... Within one year. So two of us at this table right now, if you're, if you're going by statistics, has a mental Within disorder. Within this year. Okay. I, all right. That might yeah. be a possibility. <laughs> Laura's laughing here as we say that. But, I mean, it, it, you know, we can laugh it off, but, I mean, there is something serious here. We are looking at a society that is becoming increasingly medicated, and it feels like a book like the DMS is legitimizing that. Um, Lord, does that concern you that um, people are popping a pill to feel better? Yes, of course, because, well, we are talking about disease that before doesn't exist in the discourse, okay? And uh, I'm, my concern is more about the children. How many children are, have this diagnosis? Uh, I heard that it's more than before. Yeah. That's a real problem for the, for the children. For example, it was already in DSM-4. Mm -hmm. Alan Francis said it was a big, well, it, fought, mistake, to include bipolar disorder in children, because in America, it's like, you have a child, it has problems, you get a diagnosis, and then you think you want to help him. In America, people want to prescribe drugs. Right. So uh, the diagnosis, as well as the treatment in bipolar disorder in children, has increased dramatically. And we think that's wrong. And, but, but this is a combination you, of the diagnosis and the attitude that you want to solve every problem with a pill. And, and does the DSM then reflect um, the American culture, doctor, and a, a culture that loves to write a prescription for a pill compared to Europe, which maybe um, wants a more therapeutic approach um, or some type of, I don't know, you know behavioral therapy or, or something that doesn't involve taking medication. Are we looking at cultural differences here when we're talking about this book? In a certain sense, yes. But I don't want to condemn drugs because the problem is, you know, Alan Francis wrote this book, Saving Normal. Right. This means that on one hand, we're giving drugs too early to people. But on the other hand, we don't take care of the people who are really sick. And the problem is if you're just drug bashing, well, the, uh, then the, you will prohibit giving the, medication to the people who really need it. And the doctors, I mean, it, it's people like you, you know, with all respect, doctor, but it's the doctors who are at fault here, right? The doctors are writing the prescriptions. And I can imagine as a layman that a lot of psychiatrists, a lot of therapists, 
are not capable or don't have the time to, to delve into someone's diagnosis, someone's disorder, and so they say, I'm going to write you a prescription for this drug, I'll see you in four weeks. Exactly. Isn't that what's happening? Exactly. That's what's happening. And the problem is that only about 7% of the patients with psychotic disorders are treated by psychiatrists. Most, most are treated by general physicians who don't know much about the disorder, mm. don't know much about diagnosis, and cannot wait, because this is the first thing which you have to do. If a patient comes with a problem, with a psychiatric problem, with a psychological problem, you first talk to him and then wait a little and see if he really has a disorder. And that's what general practitioners don't have time or don't take the time. But that's also a cultural um, issue too, isn't it? You've got some cultures, perhaps in the United States, where someone is more apt to go to a doctor sooner rather than later, whereas maybe in a, in a culture maybe like Germany, for example, people may wait longer before they get to a doctor. So by the time you see the physician, maybe the disorder is much more pronounced. I mean, isn't it, it, it really is different from culture to culture, isn't it? Yes, sure. I mean, and in a highly civilized country, more and more is known and you go early to the doctor. And I think one other problem here is that doctors know, for example, that uh, really severe psychotic disorders have a, so to say, pre-period of about three, four, five, six years. Mm -hmm. and you think to treat earlier is better, but that's not always true because a lot of these early symptoms are not specific and you don't know if the people really will develop this disorder. So there are no good predictors of if, if a, say, a normal problem will develop into a disorder. And that's where research has to take in. Okay, so there's the research that plays a factor. If we compare the, the DSM-5 to the DSM-4, we're talking about a 20-year span. The world has changed tremendously in the last 20 years. I mean, we are all, we all have our noses buried in our smartphones now. We're all connected all the time. Everything is much more frenetic and hectic. Are there more people with mental disorders today than we had 20 years ago? No. So uh, the impression might be there because there's burnout in, in the media and all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the scientific studies, it has been shown that the rate of mental disorders has not changed, in Europe at least, for the last 20 years. But this is only true if experienced psychiatrists look at the people, make a really representative uh, investigation and take the right diagnostic criteria. So it has not changed. Psychiatric diagnosis has not increased so, within the last decade. So you're saying um, we, we're, not, we're not getting sicker, we're not crazier, we don't have any more disorders, but this new book just gives us more names for maybe um, degrees of disorders or conditions. Well, there might be several reasons. One is the uh, hate and sensitivity for disorders. And uh, the other thing is also that there might be not so severe disorders, but which come apparent now because of changing circumstances. Mm -hmm. For example, I think definitely the global crisis has not induced new depressive disorders, but they can become more apparent because, for example, working is harder. Yeah, and maybe just more people, uh, you know, have it. I mean, that, that, that in itself is, is worthy of a show, Doctor. Thank you very much. We have to move on here now. We want to go from talking about mental disorders to talking about immigration. It's a big jump. A Mexican priest is leading a caravan of thousands of immigrants across the United States right now. In every city along the way, Father Alejandro Solalinda talks about human rights violations, how Mexico has lost the war with organized crime, and how the U.S. Congress keeps its head in the sand about the waves of people coming from south of the border. Well, in the middle are the people that he is fighting for, Latinos who are fleeing their homes to find a safer life in the U.S. And along that journey, he says, are countless violations of human rights. Moving people, the law no longer sees. Every year, thousands of migrants from Latin America seek a new life in the United States. After putting their lives at risk crossing the Mexican border, they are criminalized when they arrive in the U.S. Mexican priest Alejandro Solalinde campaigns on behalf of migrants. With lawmakers in Washington considering overhauling America's immigration laws, Solalinde helped organize the trek to draw attention to the issue. While trying to protect the rights of migrants, Solalinde has been threatened and even arrested by police along with other migrants. His aim is to speed up immigration reform. 
He wants to see steps taken to change the status of the 11 million people in the U.S. who are deemed to be illegal migrants. That would mark a victory for immigration activists. The caravan's members want to meet President Barack Obama for talks. In the U.S., a number of Hispanic trade unions, educational establishments, and the Afro-American community are supporting the caravan's aims. But what response will they receive when they finally arrive in Washington? Laura, who is Father Solalinda directing his criticism at most now? I mean, is he angry with Washington or is he angry with Mexico City? I mean, you were talking about human rights violations. But those human rights violations that he's been talking about, most of those happen before people get to the Rio Grande. Well, first, I, uh, I don't think uh, Padre, Padre Solalinda, Alejandro Solalinda, is angry with the United States or Mexico. He is uh, demanding the protection of human rights. And, well, you're right, uh, this kind of violation is happening in, the, in Mexico. But in the United States as well, because when the migrants, undocumented migrants, reach the United States, they don't have almost any rights. You know? Of course, in Mexico, the violations are more dramatic. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's imp isn't it important we make a distinction there? Yes. I mean, what's happening to people in Mexico? Yes. You know, we're talking about rapes, dra rapes we're talking about murders, Kidnapped kidnappings. Rapes. When people cross the border into the United States, we're talking about they, many of these people don't have a social security number. Yes. Okay? I mean, that's not a human rights violation. That's, that's not, also not a crime that they don't have a number. But um, what's happening before they get to the border, I mean, those are things that, you know, people are dying. Yes, a lot. Right. And disappearing. But see, a lot of people look at this story and say, why is Father Solalinde going to Washington mm -hmm. to lobby congressmen about something that is happening outside of U.S. jurisdiction? Well, because migration is a phenomenon not only of one country. Of course, migration can be an internal issue, but we are talking about a transnational phenomenon. Yes, and, and, we're, and this phenomenon uh, is related not only the country of origin, but, uh, but uh, uh, Mexico and the United States as well. Right. Yes. And because of that, it's a thing of the United States too. Um, of course, in a different way. In Mexico, we are talking about a human uh, rights violation like rape, kidnapping, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, but these people in Mexico are trying to go to the United States. And in this way, it's, uh, well, it's rela related with the United States too. Right. But I mean, but a lot of these people never make it to the United States. I mean, I, I was looking at the, the numbers of the demographics um, uh, of what's happening right now. Um, there's been a dramatic increase in the number of arrests at the border between yes. Mexico and the United States. But immigrant deaths are also up. Um, I think 70 bodies were found in the first six months of this year or the, uh, the past fiscal year in the United States. That's t more than twice as many as the previous year. Mm -hmm. um, you've got more cases of rape, more cases of, of kidnapping. All of this happening though in Mexico. And the, the people now are coming from places such as El Salvador, Guatemala. They're not necessarily coming from Mexico. Mm -hmm. So Mexico has become, if you look at the numbers, has become a minefield that these migrants have to go through before they get to the promised land. I mean, that's yes. what's going through their head right now. But what can, what can this caravan of hope, mm -hmm. it, it almost seems like their attention is misplaced. Shouldn't, shouldn't they be going on a caravan of hope through Mexico? Well, they did before, okay. I met uh, one of the first caravanas in 2008, and they are demanding uh, uh, to the Mexican government action for stop the human right violation and to find her relative because a lot of people disappear. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, right now with this caravan in the US, uh, I think Alejandro Toralinde is looking for support to press the Mexican government 
and of course uh, to to find some support in the US government mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because uh, we are talking about people who are trying to come to the United States not not only stay in Mexico but mm -hmm. that they are coming to work in the United States mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in this way, they are, a fa they are not a problem, but they are think of an uh, issue for an the issue United for States. the United States. Yes. You, you have spent time with yes. Father Solalinde. Um, you know, describe him. I mean, um, who are you know who were his flock? Who are are, 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 the, are his is his flock the Latinos who want to leave their homes? Well, he's a Catholic. He's a Catholic priest. And uh, well, he has a lot of time working with Central American migrants because mm -hmm. m the most of migrants in Mexico are from are coming from Central America. Of course, there are another nationalities, but most of them are from Central America. So mm -hmm. um, he works most with Central American people, and he tried to protect her, his rights, but not only that. Yeah. yeah. Does he have more authority, more credibility with the people, especially with these migrants, yes. than politicians in of Central course, America? Of course, yes. They trust him more, right? Yes, yes. And uh, not only because he's a Catholic priest, but he's not a politician, mm -hmm. and that is a very good thing for him, yeah. Um, let me ask our um, historian here, let, let's talk a little bit ab about what's happening here in Europe as well. Um, Laura mentioned that in the U.S. and in Europe, um, lawmakers look at migration still as a criminal act, people crossing borders without permission. Is there something that Europe could learn from what the United States is going through right now in, in dealing with this influx from Central America? Yes, um, what you see in the United States um, is um, more developed protests as we have in Europe. In Europe, they try to keep the people out uh, of the Europe, uh, center of Europe and uh, they close the borders. You, you have people trying to come from Africa they die uh, in the sea when they try to cross the sea. Mm -hmm. You have the same uh, problems here. It's not that developed as it is in America, but we have it in Europe too, and we should um, look forward uh, what possibilities we have to uh, deal this problem. I, I have no solutions, mm -hmm. um, because um, you had it in Europe uh, throughout the history that there were big migrations going through Europe. Right. You had it in Germany. Germany uh, had to, t uh, after the war, had 10 million people to um, uh, come from um, eastern parts of Germany. But, but, but we have that, that situation today. You have northern European countries telling right. the Italians and the Spaniards, you know, keep that colony on the island of Lampedusa, keep that yes. place running and make right. sure people don't escape. Right. So they're asking the Italians basically yes. to secure the borders for all of the European right. Union. Um, it that's, it that's, doesn't stop the migration. It, it, right. it doesn't yeah. stop, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't stop. Awesome. And, then, and then when people get here, and that's when we can pull in the good doctor, they have such a horrific experience behind them. They need to be in a first world environment where they can get medical care because these people are traumatized. Yes, uh, perhaps it's, I think it's not a good argument to say if they are killed in Mexico, uh, you don't have to take care for them in America. Because for example, we speak about psychiatric illness and schizophrenia, it's often said it's so biologic, biologically uh, orientated, the research, but it's known since decades that migration is one of the most uh, uh, fundamental and secure risk factors for developing schizophrenia, mm -hmm. meaning that if you migrate into a country and you suffer from circumstances there, in particular if you're illegal, that dramatically increases your risk for psychiatric illness. And that's why, for example, migration has become a hot research topic in psychiatry. Yeah, I mean, in e even the language, I know that a, a lot of organizations no longer say illegal aliens, illegal immigrants, now they say undocumented, mm -hmm. um, yeah. because that certainly has a completely different connotation and a, and a different feel to it. Um, you were telling me earlier, Laura, that um, migration, the, the ability to move, to be mobile, even across borders, um, is a 
should be a basic human right. But how do you balance that against a country's right, a nation state's right to protect its borders? Isn't that at the end of the day, isn't that what the lawmakers in Brussels, the lawmakers in Washington, isn't that the circle they're trying to square? Yes, of course. And well, that is a very complicated question. And I don't have, I think, the correct answer. But uh, well, in one side, we have uh, this nations. Uh, I think that every nation has the right to defend and protect themselves. Okay. But at the same time, we have the fact of migration. The migration right. is a fact. And <clears throat> with this uh, immigration reform, which is discussing in, in the United States right now, mm -hmm. we have the possibility or the, uh, it opened the possibility to regularize uh, one 11 million of persons. 11 million uh, people, right. That is a very good news. Right. But at the same time, we have um, another point in this reform, who, uh, which uh, look for enforcement, the border. Right, I mean, that's, that's the big yeah. story right now. That, that is, right, right. And, I mean. and well, uh, one more time, we have the figure of migrant confabulate with the figure of criminal. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's part of the rhetoric that you get in the United States. Yes. I mean, I was just there a couple of days ago, and, and that's, yeah, I don't know if that's going to change anytime soon, but that is definitely the hurdle that um, lawmakers have to jump over. All right, speaking of politics, in politics, it seems that leaders are constantly having to answer questions about their past. Now, that is standard in the U.S., Britain, France, Italy. But it is the exception here in Germany, if your name is Angela Merkel and you happen to be the chancellor. Mrs. Merkel has led the country for years, dealing with one crisis after another, always the stoic mother of calm, the poker face, which rarely reveals anything. Until now. A new biography makes claims about Mrs. Merkel's East German past, and suddenly she is having to explain what she did decades ago. And it begs the question, how well do we really know Angela Merkel? Recently, Angela Merkel has been speaking about her past in interviews. It's an attempt to soften the image of a normally very private leader in an election year. After German reunification, Merkel quickly rose through the ranks of the conservative CDU to hold ministerial office, an astonishing career path for someone from the former communist East Germany who says she was apolitical up to the fall of the wall. Now a new biography is shining a light on Merkel's early years. The first life of Angela M claims that she served as a secretary for agitation and propaganda in a communist youth organisation. Merkel has never hidden her membership of the organisation, but says she was only involved in putting on social events. So is there anything new in this biography? And why is this topic coming to the fore right now? Yeah, Mr. Stout, why all of a sudden are reporters digging into Merkel's past and, and publishing these biographies? It smells like somebody wants to make some money. Well, we, ha we will have an election this year in, mm -hmm. in autumn and uh, the interest in the persons who are leading the parties we have is rising. It's not only Mrs. Merkel, it's also the leaders of the other parties. And in Germany you have a tradition to talk about the past of politicians. When you think in the 60s everybody was talking, when it started to come up about the past of politicians in the Nazi time. Yeah, but that, that, was, a, that was an ugly past. That was an ugly right. past. And um, when, when, you could, uh, when you could show that Mrs. Merkel was part, strongly part of the system in East Germany and she was oppressing other people in the organization she was, then that would be a problem. But as I see, as far as I see now, we don't have new facts. We have the fact that she was secretary for agitation in an organization with 2.3 million young members. Every uh... like, well, Let's explain to our international audience. I mean, that title alone sounds very dubious and, and dark, you know. Agitation. What is it again? Agitation. Well, what what she had to do, or what these people had to do when they. What was the title? Agitation and Agitation what? and propaganda. And propaganda. I mean, right. that that doesn't sound very. Um, no, but that was good. a communist system, and there it was very common to talk about agitation and propaganda because it was believed to be one part of the political work to have agitation and propaganda for the good thing. 
they were believing to work for. But in the organization, I, I wanted to point yeah. out, that meant that you have uh, to raise the topics of the next discussion. You had to say, when the group comes together, what will we discuss next week? So that's what they yeah? mean with agitation. Right. Okay, that's a very violent way of <laughs> basically agenda setting is, really? is what we're talking about. But d does this mean, though, that Angela Merkel was a good communist because that was the system she was in and we should accept it and um, go, you know, maybe even forgive her and say that's just what she was born into? Well, I, I don't think that the people who were in the free German youth were good communists. Uh, most of them, 2.3 million, they were uh, asked to go into the organization when they were in school. And they were told, when you want to study, you should come into the organization, otherwise you would have problems to get a place at the universities. So a lot of people went into these organizations because they wanted uh, to study. They had a, a uh, aim they wanted to be for example like he a natural science uh, student and uh, uh, so she was just she was going with the flow basically right. which, like she, everyone else did she was doing um, what everyone else did she was an average young woman in East Germany. An, a normal woman that word comes up a lot in this show the word normal there is also the claim um, that um, she was not for German reunification um, what have you learned about that? Well, uh, at the late GDR time, um, all the people who were in opposition, only a very minority of the politically organized people in oppositional groups were for uh, the reunification. Most of them wanted to reform the system, to have a uh, reformed socialist system, more democratic, more open to the world. But is it, but, I mean, but Professor, isn't that something though that she should talk about? I mean, here you have someone who is an adult when the wall comes down and she makes it known that she wants to reform the socialist communist state. She doesn't want a reunification. And lo and behold, years later, she's the chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany. And no one's asking her, Miss Merkel, how did you make that huge cognitive and emotional jump? Um, don't you think she has an obligation to her people to explain how she was capable of, of making those, those types of gymnastics in her head? Well, I think that would be no problem for her to explain it because a lot of politicians in nowadays who come out of East Germany have to explain their own life story. Uh, even yeah, they, even they the, have, like someone like Gregor Gysi, there are lots of people well, who've right, had, he, but Angela Merkel has, I mean, there hasn't been a lot of explanation coming from her. Is this the time now for the chancellor? To, to come clean and talk about well, what she was thinking and what she, she was should, doing. She should, but I don't think that's a big problem for her because she, she talked about it before. And uh, if now new questions are raised, she said she will uh, try to answer them. Let's pull in our other people here. Um, let me ask the good doctor, um, as a good German, what do you think about these so-called revelations about the chancellor? I think it's a media thing. So, um, Blame it on the media. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we have much bigger problems at the moment than getting confessions of uh, Angela Merkel for something which is not, in my eyes at least, as far as I can judge, not something very dramatic. Uh, dramatic. And I think, uh, so for example, my generation, she's my generation, yeah. by the way, for us it was clear that also in the West that there would never be a reunification. So I mean, uh, so everyone we, had to had to basically. I speak of my. Yeah. I speak of my generation. So we were raised in the social liberal area, and it was clear there are two Germanys. There will never be a reunification. It would be even something bad because we all were raised. Yeah. Also in Western Germany, uh, in the idea that Germany, if it's too big, it's dangerous. So we thought it was, would be a good thing not to be reunified. So do you feel like you know the real Angela Merkel? No. And that doesn't bother you. No. Why not? She's in well, charge of the country. Well, you know, I think this uh, revelation kind of things which happen in America and in Britain, they are rather, 
rather a little disgusting. And what people are doing yeah, there is they're trying to construct a very, a very clean biography which nobody has. Right, but what's, so, dis what's well. disgusting about wanting to know as much as possible about someone that you entrust the welfare of your nation to? I mean, in a, in a, in a democracy, don't we expect bigger things from our leaders? And that means they have to answer bigger questions. So isn't it just human nature to want to know more about these people? Lord, what do you say? Well, yes, uh, of course, I think uh, the people or the politician must uh, give an explanation. But at the same time, I think that the people change for their time. And of course, uh, she has a past. And as uh, Henrik said, that nobody has a clean, clean past. Yeah, no know? one's saying that she has to have a clean past. Yeah. It's just opening up and letting people have access to, to her personality. I mean, that's what historians w are trying to do all the time. But well, we have, uh, I think, 12 biographies on the market. And every little piece of her life is turned around. And everybody was talking about it. And now we have it in the media again. We had it 10 years ago. So I think um, if there would be something where, where you could blame her, that she was doing something what was uh, leading to uh, bad conditions for other people mm -hmm. at that time in the organization, as far as I see, there is nothing. Do you sometimes wish, and I mean, we're running out of time, but do you sometimes wish that she would maybe sit down, maybe like come on a show like this and have a cup of coffee and talk about how she feels about certain things and also be able to say, I'm not going to say this as a politician, I'm going to just say this as a German woman. Do you sometimes wish that there was more of that here? Well, she could do it. I think it would be no problem. Done it. Well, you, you should invite her. Well, I, we are. We are constantly inviting her. I told her. I told her. Um, it, would be, it would be great to have her on the show. Um, she's up. You know, obviously she wants the government to be reelected in September. Do you think that all these biographies and these revelations, will they have an impact on the election? Yes it's, or no? It's Running? good for her. It's, it's good, good for her. her. All right. Good for the normal woman. All right. Thank you all for being on the show today. That's going to wrap up my agenda this week. Don't forget, you can watch the show again on our website and on YouTube. And don't be shy. Tell us what you think about the show. Our inbox is always open. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. Join me next time when I set the agenda.